we began discussing Hallel during the eight days of Hanukkah, and we got up to page 41 in the Hegyoni Halacha. You may remember that Tosus and Mesech the Titus on Davcha of Chesam and Beis raises the question, why is it that on Hanukkah, like Sukkot, we recite Hallel every single day, eight days, whereas on Pesach, we only recite Hal on the first day. The rest of the Hal is only a minimum, the rest of the days of Pesach. And he says that just like in Sukkot, we finish, we complete the Halel all day, all eight days. And that's because Chalukim Bekarbon Oseyem, each day has its own Kedusha Sayom, it's a unique day. So too in Hanukkah, all eight days, Every day of Hanukkah is a separate yontif because the miracle was greater and greater every day that that small amount of Shemin lasted for eight days. And now we see that the price of my Hanukkah is very meduya. The price says, L'shon acheres kovum v'asa'um yomim tovim. It should have said Kavu the Asu also Yom Tov. That he made they made Hanukkah into Yom Tov, but it says no. They made they established every day of Hanukkah as Yom Tov in the plural Russian Rabbin, because each day is a separate entity, a separate Yom Tov, and it's not what you call a Yom a, a Yom Tov Arichtov. No, it's, it's not one long continuous holiday of eight days, but each day has its own miracle, and has its own yante. The riff questions, why is it that we recite Shosanisim, the brach of Shosanisim, eight days, every single day? Why is it enough to recite Shosanisim once? And he says, because again, the nes is mischadesh, bechol yom v'yom. Every day is a new miracle, that the pach Hashem had lasted another day, and it's similar in that sense to Sukkot. The Bach in Tofresh Ayin Vav asks the question, why is it that Shechiyonu we recite only once, and Shavasadisa we recite every single day? And he answers that Shechiyonu is Olal Zmana Hanukkah, and Shavasadisa is Olal Anetz. So the Chayev of Shosah Nisim is the Ness, and every day is a separate Ness. Whereas Shechiyonu is on the Zman, a new Zman. It's like you have a new Zman of Sukkot, you have a new Zman of Pesach, and you have a new Zman of Hanukkah, and the Zman extends and incorporates all eight days into one entity, and we recite Shechiyonu on that Zman. But the Brach of Shosah Nisim is on the miracle, and every day is a separate miracle. So we are now about to start page 42 for those who like to see the text inside. And we should mention that from this point and on, the subject of the essay sort of changes a little bit. We know that on Hanukkah there were two great miracles. There was a Nes HaNitzachon, not Sola, and there was a nest of the Pach Shemit. And the Brisa of my Hanukkah and Shabbos Chav Gimel seems to indicate that the Kvius of Hanukkah, the eight days of Hanukkah, was because of the Pach Shemit. But Rashi, in Masech of Sochim, on Dav Kuf Yud Zion, implies that the Howl of Hanukkah is on the nest of the Hatzolah. The Gemara says, Tanur Abonon, Halal Zeh, Mi Omrim, who established Halal, the Vim, Tikdu Em Yisrael, Shi Omrim, Halal, Kishi Yoshia, Mitzar. When Akash Bahu redeems us and saves us from Mitzara, we establish Halal. And Rashi says, Kigong Chanaka. So Rashi attaches. Yeshua Mitzara 
to the hall of Hanukkah. That certainly does not refer to the nest of the Pach Hashemin, but rather to the nest of the Milchoma. The Maralmi Prague also seems to support that position. He says, you're going to tell me that they couldn't light the menorah in the Big Dush because all the Shemen was Tome, and now through the Nes and Pacha Shemen, they had Shemen Tar to fulfill the mitzvah of Hadlok. He says, that Nes would not generate a Chiv of Halel. Ein Chova Lomar Halel, Ela al Nes Shalat Sola, Velo al Nes Shalkima Mitzvah. You have a miracle. In the case of the Pach Hashem, that allowed you to fulfill a mitzvah, the mitzvah of Balos Kosaneros. We don't recite Hallel because God gave us a miracle that we can fulfill his mitzvah, his with a capital H. The idea of Hallel is Hanos Ha'odom. We thank Hashem for doing something for us. It doesn't make sense to recite Hallel and thank Hashem for allowing us to do something for him. Again, I'm not telling you the morale is 100% uh, convincing. You know, we always thank Hashem for giving us the opportunity of fulfilling his mitzvah. But he doesn't feel that the hall of Hanukkah would be established because of the mitzvah of Hadlok Asnero Shem Mignosh, that God facilitated that through the miracle of the Pach Hashem. He says, let's say, for example, the Gemara says that women are also obligated in the midst of Hallel because Afhein Hayu. Now, if it's the Hallel for the mitzvah of Hadlokas Ner Shemimigdash, that's a mitzvah, mitzvah Seishas Van Groma, day and night. Women are not obligated in such a mitzvah. Truth is that you and I are not obligated in that mitzvah. It's only the God who are obligated. So we're going to thank Hashem for giving us the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah of Ner Shem and Mignosh. A bit strange. Rather, says the Maral, the Hallel is Mishum Nitzach and Hamulcham for the success of the battlefield against the Greeks. Then the Maral asks himself the following question. If it's the nest of the Nitzach and Mulchama, why do we recite Hallel eight days? Clearly, the eight days reflects the nest of the Pach Hashem that lasted for eight days. If it was only a takon on the Nitzach and Mulchama, lo hoya makom letaknu eluyom echad One day of Hallel would have been sufficient. So if you have a Nitzach, we finally were victorious. Then, just like we said on Purim, that on the 14th, the Prazim celebrated their Nitzachan against the, against the uh, Malikim, and on the 15th, the uh, Shushanim, Shoshanites, uh, celebrated their victory. So a victory is celebrated on one day of Hala. In the case of Purim, we recite the Megillah instead of Hallel. So, okay, we're not going into that now. But why do we have Hallel eight days of, of Hanukkah if the Hallel is because the Nitzach and the Milcham? He mentions here something that appears in the Rishonim that the word Hanukkah really stands for Chanu Chafhe. So the Iker of Hanukkah is the 25th of Kislev is when they chanu, when they rested from the Milchama. So they commemorated the Nitzach and the Milchama on the 25th of Kislev. Chanu. Chanu means chanoya. They, they had a rest. So he says the following. Hashem yom echad even as far as the nest of the Pach Hashemen, he argues, again, this you can debate, then one day of Hallel, one day of Yontif 
to commemorate the great miracle, the Pach Hashem, it would have been sufficient. So why eight days of holiday? And why eight days of holiday? So here, on the paragraph on the bottom of 42, going on to 43, he presents this um, overlap thesis. Overlap meaning we integrate these two great miracles. What does that mean? He says the following. Nes pach Hashem elohoya nitzach legufo. This is a famous question on the pach Hashem, and we could have brought it, we could have lit it with Tumor, that's called Hutra, Tumor Hutra Mitzibur. Why do we need the, the great miracle of the pach Hashem? Well, what's, why is it necessary? Lo asa kodesh parachu nes ze, elo legalos ala nuchom. He says that if not for the Pach Hashem, one could have easily said, mistakenly, that the Nitzachan and Mulchama was Kochi Biotzen Yadi. You know, it was, uh, uh, I heard once from my Rebbe that the, it wasn't really the Yavonim that fought against the Jewish people, it was mostly in the Siyavim. So we had a, a war of attrition, you know, a terrorist kind of war against the, against the enemy. And Baruch Hashem, we were successful. But he says there's a chashash. Here I think there's a printing error in the text. It says here, Hashem I think that's a mistake in the print. But I think what he's saying is that we might have a, a mistake that maybe the Mulchama was not Me Hashem. It wasn't part of a divine plan. It was simply... A, a, a battle of a liberating force, freedom fighters. So therefore, us Hashem is Nesa Pach Hashem. So Pach Hashem is clearly a miracle. It's something that denies uh, physical reality. And he says on the top page 43 that we can now integrate these two miracles together. They both represent Echus on top of Kamus. What does that mean? Obviously, Kamus means we have enough oil for one day, but Echus means God created a new essence out of that Kamus, such that it could last for eight days. And in the case of the Mulchama, once again, it's Echus above Kamus. Rabim, the Adviati. He says on the first night, they poured in all the Shemin that they had in that one pot into the menorah. And on each night, including the first night, only one eighth of the oil was consumed. So that we had a small amount of Shemin that lasted for a full night, one eighth of what normally would add would last for a day. And that's called his alus echus. That through the echus, we overcome the limited counts. The hater vidocha choshech shall have And in that sense, the, the ness of the pachashemen, domel le ness there's a certain striking similarity. That these few Kaanim Kidoshim that were Bali Echus, they had the essence of Tara and Sidkus and Kedusha, they were Osik the Torah, and they overcame the Rabbi. So the Pachashem and Lola Lamed al Atzmo Yotza, El Lamed al Nes Hamulchama Yotza. The Maral's thesis is that the Pach Hashem and its miracle is not for its own sake, namely for the mitzvah of Baalos Chasaneros, but rather it is for the purpose of teaching us that God brings about a miracle of Echus over Kamos. And that's a reference to the Nest of the Mulchom. And here's where the Maral wants to explain and shed a new light on the language of the Rambam. 
the Rambam at the beginning of Hilchas Hanukkah says that the purpose of the Ner Hanukkah when Klal Yisrael overcame their enemies, What is the double language here that the Ramam employs? Laharos ulegalos, to show and to reveal. So the Maral offers the following explanation. That Tadlokas Neros is laharos es nes pachashem. So what's legalos? Legalos means to shed a light and reveal the nature of the milchama, that the milchama was also a nes of rabbi v'yadmiyatim, of echus overcoming kamas. And if that be the case, when we recite haneros halolu, it says, So we're talking about Neiros Halolu, and we throw in the word Melchamos. That seems to be a little bit off base, because we know that the Neiros are meant to commemorate the, the great miracle of Pachashem, and why are you mentioning the Melchamos? But the answer is that Laharos is the nest of the Pachashem, and Legalos is Legalos and therefore, the Neros Halolu will include the Milchama as well. So women are obligated in their Hanukkah because Afein Hoibo Sanes. So Rashi explains that they were included in the Xeros of the Yavanim, I call Habasula, Tiboya Lehegmon, etc., etc. And we're not talking about anything related to the Pach Hashem. You're trying to justify why women are obligated in the mitzvah of Ner Hanukkah. And you tell me because the women were also included in the Gzera of the Yavadu. Something's off base over here. What is the Pach Hashem and the Ness of, and the Chiv mitzvah of, of Hadlok and I look at their Hanukkah have to do with the fact that they were included in the Xera. Apparently, Rashi understood, as we said earlier, that the establishment of the mitzvah of Hadlokas near Hanukkah is not just on the Pach Hashem, but it's on the entire Hatsola of Kalal Yisrael. So the Maral finishes up his presentation here in the middle of page 44 by saying that Tiknu Lomar Halel, the Takon of eight days of Halel, Al Hanitzachon Shalom Ilchama. So you ask why eight days of Halel? We said that one day of Halel should be enough to commemorate the miracle of the Ilchama. And the answer is, Kim Mispar Hayomim Shenis Galen Nes HaMilchama Ahiyadeh that if the ness of the Pach Hashem, of the Neros, was meant to be Megala, to reveal the miracle of the Nitzachon, so we have eight days of Pach Hashem, those eight days of miracle will reveal the miracle of the Melchama, and therefore we're going to recite Halel on all of those eight days. It's very uh, complex structure here where you integrate two different Nisim into one mitzvah of Hala, one obligation of Hala. And at the end, the Maral goes through the eight different shuos that we mentioned in Allah Nisu. Rav to us Rivon, Dan to us Tino, Nakam to us Nikmoso, Masar to Gibor Mad Choloshi, Rav Miyad Miyatim, Tmei Miyad Tahorim, Rishon Miyad Sadikim, Zed Miyad Roske, Rishon Secha, those eight different shuos, all of which reflect on the Mulchama, none of which reflect on the Pach Hashem, they represent the backbone of al which we recite for the Nitzachan and the Mulchama, and the eight different dimensions of the al of the shuos, reflect on the eight days of Hanukkah, the eight days of Halakha. So it's very fascinating that it comes out according to the 
Maral in Prague that the real essence of Ner Hanukkah and the Alanisim and the and the also the uh, Haneris Halol that we recite after Ner Hanukkah is is very much focused on the Mulchama. Now he asks the question, the Maral again, why did God choose the Ness of the Pach Hashemen to reflect on the miracle of the Mulchama? He says the following, the main essence of the Mulchama of the Yavonim and their goal was Letame Yisahechal. As the Ramam opens up Hilchas Hanukkah, so the battle of the Yavana was not to destroy, to annihilate the Jewish people, that's not Hanukkah, that's Purim, but rather to be Metame the Taros. It was a battle against Tara. Lefichach, Nivchar Hashemen, Shu Simon Litara. That of all the dimensions of the base on Migdash, of the Hechal, the one single dimension that reflects on Tahara more than anything else is the Shemen, the Shemen of the Menorah. And he writes in the footnote here, based on the Kafachayim, that Shemen, he says, he has a minute to add a little bit of water to the shemen. The shemen she Israel mostly mola mala vagoyim hameshulim lemayim zdonim lemata. So somehow the shemen floats onto the top. The water is on the bottom, and that shemen, which represents Taras Israel, is superior and subordinates the subjugates the mayim, which represents the umos haolam. And then he goes on and on to describe the Shemen and why the Shemen represents Tara and why the Shemen was the vehicle of, of proving Avis B. Israel, of publicizing the Shechina B. Israel, the unique nature of the Jewish people. All this has to do with Shemen. And the, the, the Shemen has a metaphoric meaning of Tara that reflects on the Shechina and its relationship to Klal Yisrael. He says, for example, that Shemin Zayis is unique because Eitzo Upirio Shavin, the certain similarity between the olive tree and the Oil that comes from the olives. Shneim eno makablin tarovis. Hashem eno misarim mashkim acherim. Vagam eitz hadas ein taruvoso vigidulo sheinav arkom. There's no way of grafting another tree onto an olive tree. It just will never take. It's a, a biological fact. And so to shemen that comes from the olive branch can never mix up and combined with any other liquid. And all this indicates what the Pasuk tells us in Tehillim, that Klal Yisrael are considered like Sile Zesim. And the Pasuk describes, Bon Echa, your children, Hashem, Kish Sile Zesim, Smim L'Shulchanacha, L'Shulchanacha. It means that we are compared to the growth, the saplings of an olive tree, because this Eitz Azayis will not receive any arkava. It will not take to any grafting. And David HaMelech is blessing us that we too should be Zoha to be like the Sile Zesim of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that will be on his capital H table, and we will not mix with any Shemin Pasuk with anything that's contaminated. So that's why the Hashemunah was seeking out when they entered into the Migdash 
Shemen Tar, of all the things, there are many dimensions to the Big Dash. You know, the Solus Lebanachot and the Ziyayim Lina Sachim. Why were they focused and obsessed with finding Shemen Tar? And the answer is that even though halachically, strictly, Tumahotra Mitzivur, nevertheless, they didn't want to rely on that head thing. They wanted to see if they could defeat the Tuma of the Yavadim that was specifically focused on the Shemen. V'timu kalashmonim. Why is it that the Yavadim had a special, shall we say, agenda to be Matami the Shmonim? They single out the Shmonim because the Shmonim represent the fact that we are a special people with a relationship to Shechina. We don't, we refuse to mix with any other liquid, any other substance. We are pure and Tara, Tara Gemura. This is what upset the Yavanim, and that's why they attacked the Shemen of the Zayas tree. And they tried to be metame all the shemen, which they were pretty successful in doing so. Before we go on to the next chapter, which is Mahajan, Mahajan, Mina Mahajan on page 47, I just wanted to share with you. I don't know if you by chance saw it, I can send it to you if you want. But recently, they um, created a video based on a, a recording of something Rav Soloveitchik said 50 years ago. And for me, it was a chidush. I don't know. I thought I knew everything that Rav Soloveitchik said about Hanukkah, but obviously I don't. And I, so this is a chidush. If you want, I can forward you the, uh, the, the, uh, the recording. It's very fascinating. But just to share one idea with you, he has a stira between two sugyas. In one sugya, the Gemara says that if you see a Sefer Torah being burned, then you have to rice kriya twice, two kriya. You have to rip your garment twice. Once on the gvilin, hanisrafim, the parchment that burns, and the others on the ksav, on the osios that are burnt. And I, I don't remember who says this, but it's one of the Amorim. Right now, I don't remember. So Rav Salvechik asks a stira, the Gemara in Avodazor Daf Yitzayin about the Asura Ruge Malchus tells us about the terrible, tragic death, the tormenting death of Rav Hanani ben Tradion. They wrapped him up, the Romans wrapped him up in a Sefer Torah, and they lit fire, and the Talmud asked Rabbi Hanina ben Shadya, what do you see? And he says, I see Gvil in this Rafin, the parchments are burning, the osios parchos ba'avi. It means that the Romans were not successful in burning the osios. They can only burn the parchment. The osios represent a hidden world of divinity, and that they couldn't destroy. So our enemies can only destroy the physical body, the gvilin, but not the osios. And that's the Gemara in the name of Rab Hananim and Traja, one of the Tanoim. How can the Amoraim say that we have to cut Kriya twice on the destruction, on the burning of a Sefer Torah. And the second one, in addition to the Gvilin, is on the Ksav, on the Osios. The Osios are not burned. The Goyim, our enemies, did not have the power to destroy the Osios. So why is there a Kriya on the Osios? Beautiful Kasha the Rav. I mean, again, you may come up with different answers to this question, but the Rav has a unique approach. And he says the following. These two statements, one of Rav Hanani ben Traj and the other of the Amoraim, 
are referring to two different periods in Jewish history. One period is the period of the Greeks, the Yavanim, and the other of the Romans. And he says the following, the Romans wanted to destroy the Jewish people, but they couldn't impact on the osios, the osios that represent the neshama, the soul of the Jew, his spirituality, his love for Hashem, that they couldn't touch, they couldn't destroy. And that's called osios parchos diamir, those same osios of the Sefer Torah, Shabbo Nisraf, Chananyi Ben Tranyon, those osios will find their place in another parchment, in another gvil. They will never be destroyed. But he says, the issue of two creos versus one creo depends upon who is burning the safe Torah. If a non-Jew is burning a Sefer Torah, he cannot impact on the Osios, on the Ksav. That's beyond his reach. Why does the Gemara say that we recite a double, we implement a double Kriya, one for the Gvilin and one for the Osios? That's when a Jew destroys the Sefer Torah. A Jew has the ability to attack the very neshama of the Jewish people. And Rav Soloveitchik has many, many proofs that who is at the forefront at the time of the Yavanim to undermine the Jewish religion, the Shman, and the attack against Judaism, it was Jews themselves, what we call them the Siyavnim. And they represented, listen to this, the majority of the Jewish nation. Now, if you took a population census, more than 50% of the Jews became Messiavim. And what they were doing by burning the Sefer Torah is they were attacking not just the Gvil, but a Jew has the ability, Chas Mishalom, to destroy even the Ksav, even the spirit itself. And therefore, we have to cut Kriya twice. And Rav Soloveitchik says that the great miracle of Hanukkah is that Hashem brought about a situation in which that piece of history at the time of the Yavanim, in which the Misyavnim were Rabim Biyad Biyatim. Rabim meaning they were the majority of the Jewish people that were renegades and defied and denied our spirituality and our unique chosenness and relationship to Shekhinah, that situation would never, ever occur again. So when we say by Yom Ahem, that's the Tophel. That's the secondary part of the Hodoya Takonish Baruch The fact that he saved us from the enemies at the time of the Yavon and the Visyavnim who attacked us. That's Fayyom Ahem. But the real miracle, he says, the essence of the miracle, he calls it, it a Nes Nistar, not the Nes Nigla. The Nes Nigla was that we were able to survive and defeat the Yavon and the Visyavnim. But the realness is by Yomim Basman that this would be the Greek period would be the last period in Jewish history in which the majority of the Jewish people would try and attempt to destroy the spirituality of the Jewish people. Never again would there be a generation in which the majority of the Jewish people would attack the Sefer Torah and burn the Sefer Torah. Halavai, we should be zolcha to see this in our time. In any event, if anyone's interested in getting this recording, because I left out a lot of details, but let me know, and I'll if you have WhatsApp, I'll send it to you by WhatsApp, in case you haven't heard it yourself. Yes, yes, please. Right, just do me a favor, send me a one line there.
a one line WhatsApp because, you know. All right. Now, Rabosai, we begin the concept of Mahajun Mina Mahajun. So we know that near Hanukkah, the Gemara says in Shabbos Chof Aleph, is near Yishu Beso. All you have to have is one candle for the entire family. Mahajrin is near Luchol Echad V'Echad. And Mahajrin Mina Mahajrin is Keneged Yomim Ayotzim, Keneged Yomim Hanif Nosim. Beisola Beitsham. Now in this essay, Rav Mursky, Rav Yitzchak wants to analyze the Yisoda Plukta between Beisola Beitsham. But let's begin with some other machlokas, which is a little bit less dramatic, but also very important. And that's the level of mahaj. Machlok Shri Beisola Beitsham is Mahajin Mina Mahajin. But there's a machlokas between the Rambam and the Ramah, believe it or not, about Mahajin. Ner l'chol echad v'echad. What does ner l'chol echad v'echad mean? The Rambam writes that the Madli should light the number of candles that correspond to the number of the members of the household. So there's only one Madli. The Ramah writes that ner l'chol echad v'echad means that every member of the household should light his own candle. So Alan Minig reflects that in the Ramah, but the Rambam wants one madli. Why? Why does the Rambam want one madli? So this question is raised by the Brisker Rav. It is Chidushe Marana Griz Alevi Ala Rambam Hilchus Chanukah, and in my humble opinion, he gives such an amazing insight into the Rambam Shita that I don't understand the Rambam. Even though, again, initially I told you I don't understand the Rambam, but after the Brisker Rav. He tips the scale in the opposite direction. And he says the following. The Gemara Mesechta Shabbos, dealing with mitzvahs mila on Shabbos, we know that if the eighth day is Shabbos, is Bayom HaShmini Afilu the Shabbos, it's Doche Shabbos. And the Gemara says, Bishleim, I understand what's called tzitzin hama'akvin es ha'mila, right? There's certain threads of, of skin that have to be cut. That's critical to the mix of mila. That should be doch Shabbos. But what about tzitzin she'en ma'akvin es ha'mila? Those tzitzin are cut because of zekeli van veil, what we call hider mitzvah. So the Gemara establishes that it depends on Piresh or low Piresh. If he was Piresh, that means the Moel lifted his hand after cutting the Tzitzit Ma'akvin, and now he wants to go back and continue after that interruption to be Mal the Tzitzit She'en Ma'akvin Samila, that doesn't override the shop. However, if low Piresh, He's still involved in the continuous Misa Mila, and he didn't take any interruption. Then he continues to cut even the Tzitzin She'ena Ma'akvin Mila because of Zekeli Avey. The Rambam quotes the difference between Piresh and Lo Piresh in Hilchas Mila, and he's not referring to Shabbos. Again, the Briska Rav goes through the entire sugya to show you where the Rama was coming from. That's not for us now. But suffice it to say that on a weekday Mila, the Rama Paskins said if he was Piresh, if the Moel lifted up his hands after Tzitzin Hama Akvinus Amila, he does not cut the Tzitzin She'en Hama Akvinus Amila. Why not? Zekeli Yalveu. Who cares whether it is Piresh or low Piresh? So the Briskarov in a breakthrough Chiddush says the following. You can only be Mekayim Zekeli Yaveu when you're involved in the Maisa Mitzvah. If the Maisa Mitzvah is complete, that's called Piresh, and you fulfill the Mitzvah, there's no Zekeli Yaveu. It's too late to go back and improve the Mitzvah. Again, this is my own Marshall Lamar Let's say I took an Esro 
and I fulfilled my mitzvah esrog. It was a, a knapper esrog. Now you offer me an esrog mahudar, a beautiful esrog. It's worth a thousand shekel. Can I take that esrog and be mekayim zekayim yavehu? Says the briskarov, absolutely not. It's meaningless. You already fulfilled your mitzvah. And this I heard from my Rebbe in the name of Chaim. I think I discussed this with you on many occasions. You know, you have two Esrogim in front of you. One is Mahuda, one is She'eno Mahuda. Which one should you take first? And Reb Chaim says, take the Eino Mahuda. Excuse me. Take the, take the Mahuda first, because if you take the Eino Mahuda, then it would be meaningless to take the Mahuda afterwards. You've already fulfilled your mitzvah. Says the Briska Rav, if in the Rambam's frame of reference, Ruvain would light the first candle, and then Fahina Mitzvah Shimon is going to light the second candle, that's by definition Piresh. You've already fulfilled, and that means every member of the household has fulfilled the Mitzvah of their Hanukkah with that one candle that was lit by Ruvain. Therefore, the Rabbah wants one Madwik to light both candles, or 10 candles of the 10 people in the house. Why? Because that's equivalent to low peerage. He's still involved in the Maisen Mitzvah when he hasn't given over to another person in the household to light the candles. But the Briskarov proves that the Ramah has a different sheet in Mila, and the Ramah would hold that on a weekday, even after Piresh, he would still cut the, the tzitzin she'ena ma'akvin esamila, meaning he could still fulfill the mitzvah of zekel yavehu even after having completed the ma'isa mila and achieved the kiyum of mila with the tzitzin ma'akvin esamila. Personally, at this point, I jumped out of my seat and I said, I don't understand the Ramah. You know, before when I started and I saw the Rambam says one madly, I didn't understand the Rambam. But now I am so persuaded by the logic, the compelling logic of the Brisket Rav, I don't understand the Rambam. How can you have a Hebrew mitzvah once the bias has already been Mekayim the mitzvah? So I started thinking maybe we could, have, you know, Shimon will have Kavana not to be Yotze with Ruben's lighting. I don't know. I came up with wild uh, ideas. But I think the answer is the following. Oh, good game. Joe, you want to give me an answer? Yeah, I, I want to hear what the rep says. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's what I wanted to say. The Ramah also agrees in principle. Oh, I, I thought there was something on my screen. It's on your wall, Joe. Okay. Anyway, no, no, no. It's just, uh, it's probably an electric socket or something. Anyway, so the Ramah agrees in principle that once the mitzvah is completed, there's no room for either mitzvah. However, the Ramah holds that if the mitzvah is not just the Maisa and Gavra, but it's also the Chefza, then by improving the Chefza and upgrading that mitzvah, he can be Makayim, even though the Gavra has removed his hand. So in Mila, the mitzvah Mila is not just the Maisa of cutting the, the Tzitzim, it's also to create the Mila. Here's where the Ramah says, that even if he was Piresh and the Maisa Gava was complete, he can still be Mahad in the Mitzvah to improve the Cheft. This is Burzon talking. I mean, don't, don't blame the Brisker Rav for this. So I wanted to suggest that the Ramah in their Hanukkah holds that the Mitzvah is not just on Laka, but it's in the Cheft of the Bias. And you can improve the Bias and its ability to be Mepharsim and publicize the miracle even after the Gavra has completed his Maisad Laka. So therefore, when Ruvain lights his candle, Shimon could be Mahad in the mitzvah by improving the bias, and now the bias reflects on two individuals, not on one. Whereas the Rambam is totally focused on the Maisa mitzvah, and once the Maisad Laka of Ruvain was implemented, and he completed it, and he was Piresh, now he hands over the Shavish to Shimon to light Shimon's. That's too late because the Rabbin puts all the emphasis on the Misa mitzvah. And you can only have Hebrew mitzvah if you can integrate that Hebrew mitzvah into the Misa mitzvah. 
like in the case of Tzitzin, She'eno Ma'akrin is Hamila, he's already been Piresh after he cut the Tzitzin and Ma'akrin is Hamila. There's no room now, according to the Rambam, for either mitzvah once the Maisa mitzvah was implemented and he was Makayim the mitzvah. If I can add to the Kiddush, that, that, uh, that you could also perhaps extend it to the question of whether, you know, when you light a menorah out, like outside for the oilam, um, and so you're, there's more pursuing Isa. Outside your is, house, you mean, Bob? Yeah, yeah, like, you know. You're like not talking the, about, uh, you know, on the White House lawn. You're no, I'm talking about the public, the public, a public menorah. So you're creating another Chavtah Mitzvah. So even though you, let's say, you should be able to make a bracha and so on, because it's it's a, you're doing, you know, you're creating another Chavtah Mitzvah. So wait, Bobby, if I understand you correctly, I live inside my house. Right. A bracha. Now I go outside my house. Right. And I want to light a menorah in the public. So I'm adding to right. the curse of my nest. Could I make a bracha on that? Right, I, I mean, that was the Shiloh we I, talked I about. Tell you, I would tell you that even the Ramah would agree in this case, you can't make a bracha on that. Why? Because there's only one bias. And right. your obligation is to light a candle in the bias, which you already did. Now, you're right. If Let's say, again, I, I would say the following. And this is, uh, you know, with limited liability. But let's say, as you're lighting the candles, right. you go outside and continue lighting the candles. You know, because otherwise, if it's not, even the Ramah agrees in principle, you need a tziruf. You have to somehow link up your Hebrew mitzvah to the original mitzvah. And it's only one bias. So I think the only way you can do that, if you go outside the bias, is if you're still toch kidei the maisa mitzvah. All right, think about it. I mean, it's a very fascinating topic. But again, the brisket rub doesn't touch on any of this. The brisket right. rub goes with one mahal. And that is, after I completed my Maisa Mitzvah, can I now fulfill Hebrew Mitzvah with a separate Maisa Mitzvah? The Rambam says absolutely not. And therefore, he requires one Madlik. And Ne'er L'chalecha Vecha just tells you how many Ne'eros the Madlik is going to light, corresponding to the number of the members of the household. Whereas the Rambam holds, yes, you could be Makayim Hebrew Mitzvah even after the Maisa Mitzvah. Joe, can can I also add to it if you don't mind? Uh, that there's a story with uh, with regards to uh, that as long as the mitzvah is able to be seen even after the meiser mitzvah, then there there would be a heater. So, so exactly, Van Beel would continue to be recognized on a different level. You know, there's a story with David Amalek where he was whatever it, uh, un, undressed. And oh, uh, the big one, right, right, and 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 he sees his mila, and he, then he says he's always uh, he always has the mitzvah. So that concept that uh, you know that as long as the mitzvah is there, you you can you can still beautify it, so to speak, so that uh, anyone who that it's still even though the the ma'aser mitzvah is gone, the mitzvah is still there. There's still this concept of uh, zakeli ben Bey. Okay, it's a little bit similar to what I wanted to say, Joe, that definitely there's something called the hefts of the Mila, you know, that the... Okay, Rabosai, let's see, we have five more minutes. And he says the following, Betama Machlokas, so what is the essence of the Machlokas? So in the Gemara itself, the Machlokas between Basil and Shami is interpreted in two different ways. We start with Rav Yossi Bar Ovin, and then we go to Rabbi Yossi Bar Zvida. According to one, Beit Shammai wants to reflect on Yomim Hanich Nasim. So it means the miracle on the first day was the greatest miracle. Why? Because the Shemin is going to last for eight days. So we anticipate, again, we can only do this on Monday morning, not on Sunday, if you know what I mean. Uh, if you're a quarterback, right? So now we see in retrospect that already on the first day, there was a miracle of eight days. 
So let's say if we go to Maral Mitrag that we mentioned earlier, only one eighth of the Shemen was consumed. So we have already in potential a miracle of eight days. On the second day, we only have a miracle of seven days and so forth and so on. And Basil hold Keneged Yom Mayotze. Then we look at the candles at the Shemen and we see that every day the miracle increases because now we have a second day of miracle and then we have a third day of miracle. Then on page 48, the Gemara quotes another interpretation. Beis Hillel, I'm sorry, Beit Shammai is based on Pariachad, right? We start with 70 Parim and every day of Sukkot we bring less and it goes down in number. But I, I shouldn't say 70. I'm sorry. 70 is the total. But what I meant to say, we start with 14 and down to Kenegid Pariachad. And Beis Hillel, Mosef Aholech, because of Mylin Bekodesh, Vien Moridim. The Gemara then goes on to tell a story about Shnei Zekedim, where you've been Sidon, Echad Osek Beis Shammai, Echad Osek Beis Hillel. And one gave his explanation, Kipari Achag, and the other, Mylon Bekodesh. So we see that the Gemara Lamaskana seems to accept that the fundamental issue between Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel is the <laughs> second interpretation, namely that Beis Shammai is based on Pari Achag and Beis Hillel on Mylon Bekodesh. So the Marsha asks the following question. Could it be that Beit Shammai deny the principle of Milo B'Kodesh? Milo B'Kodesh is derived from Sukim in the Gemara Menachos on Dav Tzaditess. It has to do with the Machtos of Korach Adoso, the 250 Machtos that they're using to be Machtir the Torres. And after their death, HaKosh Prochum commanded to take these machtos and make it sipui lemizbeach. And first it was tashmishe mizbeach, and now it became gufo shol mizbeach. And that's called mailu bekodesh. So how could it be that Beit Shammai denied the principle of mailu bekodesh? Then there's another question here on Beit Shammai from the Pnei Yoshua. Ma inyan ad lokas neros chanako mishum pursue nisa tzol pari He's now going back to the concept of Pariachad. My, my Israeli children say, Ma Kesha, what's the connection between Pariachad and the nest of the Pach Hashem? Says the Marsha, Beit Shammai also agree and embrace the sheet of Milo Bekodesh. But the principle of Pariachad trumps the principle of, of Milo Bekodesh. So if all things are equal, Beit Shammai would say Milo Bekodesh. But if there's a specific reason to undermine and replace Milan B'Kodesh, then Milan B'Kodesh always has to give way to another reasoning. And here we have the reasoning of Pariachat. Why? Because, says the Marsha, the Shivan Parim that Klal Yisrael would be makrim during the entire course of Sukkot, are a that number corresponds to the Shivim Umos Haolam. And when they come to the base on Migdash, they are Polksim Baholksim. And that's a remez that the Umos Haolam Yelchu Vyifkasu. And in our battle against the Yavanim, we desperately need this metaphor of Polksim Baholchim. That just like in Sukkot, the Umas Holam represented by the various carbonas that are brought during Sukkot are Polchim the Polchim, so too at the time of Hanukkah we need this Holchim U Polchim. So this is the sheet of Beit Shaman. I think we'll stop here. There's a lot, lot more to go, as you know. Um, uh, David photocopied for us, I think, the next uh, 15 pages or so. I'm not sure exactly the number, but um, next Wednesday is already, it's not even Isru Chag, it's already post Isru Chag. So I want to get back to Tefillin. I'm very excited about Tefillin. So just let me know, David, I think you have the pages of Tefillin, so there's no need to circulate more pages, but double check me on that. All right. So let me, 
What? David, what do you say? Well, how many how many different articles do you want to fill in? Well, well if you could tell me, I don't know if you can do this for me, but tell me until what page we got to in fill in. Oh, and right. how many pages do we still do we still have left? I don't know if you can do that for me. If not, I'll have to do that myself. Yeah, I think but, I'll do yourself. I'm not sure. All right, I'll yeah. have to do that myself. Okay yeah. then. So, so let me know. You let me know by Monday. Let's see next week which pages you want sent out. Yeah, believe neither. Believe neither. I don't okay. want to take it neither, but I'll try my best. Okay then. Right. So okay, let's yeah. take this opportunity to wish you all a great Hanukkah. What's ever left, we have already here. We already lit three three light. I think also by you, you lit lit three light. And yeah. another half hour or so, we're going to be lighting number four. Uh, the fourth the fourth candle, which means we're getting to the half point. And, and uh, it's been a very important therapeutic experience now for both me and my wife to enter into Hanukkah after the, the period of time that we this. My wife is now with the rest of the family. I didn't want to cancel the Shia. They went out to Shiloh. Have you ever been to Shiloh? No. Well, Shiloh, it's an unbelievable arche archaeological find. I mean, I'm not a big archaeologist, you know, and I am... Um, Usually I'm, I'm very skeptic, but here it really seems